welcome to this National MS Education and Awareness Month conference hosted by MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. It is made possible with support by Biogen, Genentech, Novartis, EMD Serrano, Sanofi, Bristol Myers Squibb, and Vatris. I'm your host, Sherry Bins, and I'm the patient healthcare liaison for the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. Today, I am joined by a panel of people that I have known and worked with for several years. Jennifer and Dan Digman are a couple who are both living with MS. Sean Feliciano is an entrepreneur and financial advisor who is living with MS. She is bilingual. So she's comfortable. If you're more comfortable asking your questions in Spanish, she'll be happy to answer them. And I'll tell you how to do that as we get towards the end. Seth Morgan, who completes our panel, is a neurologist who is retired early because he is also living with MS. And uh, he tells me in our get acquainted session that he was born in Spain, so he also speaks Spanish. So you've got Sean and Seth if you need to communicate in a language other than English. Uh, they will be speaking about their advocacy with MS and how they got involved in that. So I'm going to turn it over and let each of them tell you a little bit about what they do. And after the presentation, we'll open it up for questions. So we'll start with Jennifer and Dan. Hi, thank you for the introduction, introduction Sherry. I'm Jennifer Digman, as you heard, and it's interesting that Dan and I met, good heavens, 20 years ago almost, at an MS function, and I was instantly taken with him, and that's kind of how our advocacy journey started. We actually got married, and I have MS, and when we got married, it was like we needed to have the help, you know, because I worked full time and Jennifer is living with secondary progressive MS. So it was like, how would I be able to work and still have Jennifer get the care that she needed? And that's how we learned about the Michigan My Choice Waiver Program, which provides assistance for Jennifer. So she has somebody here to help her with activities of daily living while I continue to work full time. And that's something that came from funding from the state. And that's how we first got involved, realizing, oh my gosh, activism, advocacy, that could be us, that we would go down to legislate and talk to our legislators in Lansing, the capital of Michigan, um, every year to um, encourage support for funding of the My Choice Waiver Program. And that's how the ball started rolling and it was a snowball and it just really started to build from there and we got involved then with the national ms society doing advocacy there at the local state federal levels and everything just learning the beauty of advocacy and just how important that is in the efforts to raise awareness and support multiple sclerosis programs. And our voice is so powerful. And when we met and started dating, it didn't seem possible because I'm in a wheelchair. How could we make it work? But again, through that program, and that's why it's so important to us. And now 17 years into our marriage, we go down to Lansing and we advocate for the program every year and advocate for multiple sclerosis issues as well as Dan said. So that's our story. And you guys were at the state house today? We, because of COVID, we were virtually advocating and we met with our legislator, um, our legislative assistant here in Michigan. He was in Washington, DC. And it's just really powerful. And it's, it's nice when you can, build a relationship and talk about issues that are important and they understand the legislators really understand our voice and we can use our voice and i think that's part of the the beauty of advocacy is the when you continue to do it year after year 
you don't have to go through like the formalities of an introduction. It was like we we got on, you know, a Zoom call with the um, legislative aide for our congressman to just say, you know, we could just jump right into the issues, more like catching up with an old friend, so to speak. And so that's just really empowering. And you feel like you're really making a difference, not only for yourself, but now for the, you know, nearly million other people in the US living with MS. So it's, it's very empowering. Thank you. Um, Sean, would you introduce yourself to the group, please? So my name is Sean Feliciano. I, I live in Arizona and I was diagnosed back in 2009. I knew nothing about multiple sclerosis. So when I heard that I had this chronic illness, uh, I started doing a little bit of research. I realized that I, I, I knew nothing about this. And I started in my process, I felt sorry for myself. I, I didn't know how to cope with the disease. And it took me quite a while to, to figure out um, that I probably was not the only one feeling this way. And in my search for answers and, and in knowing that um, I, I had this disease, um, I, I was diagnosed twice because the first time I, I was in denial and I needed a second opinion. Um, I realized that because I couldn't be the only one, I needed to do something not only um, to, to help myself understand, but I, I knew that I needed to help other people. And one of the reasons, not, not only in my journey and my search and quest, but also I started realizing that as a Latina, um, I was probably in a, a field with many other Latinos and Latinas that don't really understand one, the disease, and two, don't know how to convey that to, um, to our doctors. And we're maybe not receiving all of the care that we need to receive because maybe, maybe English is not our first language. Maybe it's Spanish, but maybe we don't have a Spanish physician. And so I had all of these questions and, and, and these um, situations in my mind that I needed answers to. And I felt um, that the only way to make myself vulnerable and to help others was to get out there and advocate for multiple sclerosis, to educate other people, to educate other Latinos and, and Latinas that we're not alone in this, in this journey. Um, I got involved with I Conquer MS, with the society, uh, with the foundation. Um, I think once you start, once you're an advocate, you, you start becoming an advocate for so many organizations and so many different um, areas and venues because it's just another way to get out there and to, um, to explain what we do and how to get others to, to really um, make yourself vulnerable and to get out there and, and know that um, we're not alone. And I can, I speak Spanish, so I can also say this in Spanish. Um, um, eh, fui diagnosticada en 2009 y en ese tiempo eh, yo no sabía nada de esclerosis múltiple. Y creo que fue en esa decisión de, de saber más, de conocer a otras personas con esclerosis múltiple, eh, tenía muchas, muchas preguntas y había muchas preguntas, pero no tenía, yo no tenía eh, alguien que podía darme la solución que yo necesitaba. Entonces, eh, en ese tiempo también, como no sabía nada, eh, tenía dudas y me sentía muy, muy sola. Entonces, fui indagando, indagando. Eh, fui eh, haciendo preguntas y supe que yo no era la única latina con esclerosis múltiple y con esas preguntas. Entonces eh, decidí que quería ser parte de la solución y en ser parte de la solución era también ayudar a otras personas como yo con esclerosis múltiple. Eh, fui miembro y todavía soy 
de I Conquer MS, de la eh, Society, de la fundación eh, que está participando hoy, hoy en día. Y eh, ellos me dieron la voz para poder eh, ser parte de la solución. Y en siendo parte de la solución, eh, me da mucho honor de poder ayudar a otras personas, porque como latinos, latinas, nosotros necesitamos ser parte de la solución, porque si no somos parte de la solución, no vamos a saber qué es lo mejor para nosotros. Entonces, bienvenidos hoy a esta charla. Thank you. Thank you. Seth. Thank you, Sherry. You know, um, I absolutely love the introductions that I've just heard. Um, my, I actually got into this uh, realm uh, sort of in a circuitous fashion. I was a, a practicing neurologist for over 20 years in the Washington, Washington DC area. And um, for years, I was referring people to these support groups and these support or, uh, organizations. So my connection initially was as a referring physician, sending my patients for more support. Um, and then uh, back in 2004, I was diagnosed, actually I diagnosed myself with my own case of uh, MS um, and my life turned upside down. Um, and after licking my wounds for a while, uh, one of my good friends at the MS Society contacted me and said, you know, you live in the Washington DC area, you're a trained neurologist, so you know the science, and now you're, you're living with MS, what a perfect uh, trifecta for having uh, someone go to Capitol Hill and meet with our elected officials. Would you consider doing uh, advocacy? Now, advocacy to me is educating. And part of my training and part of my work for, for the longest time was educating young uh, rising medical students and, and doctors. So it was a natural uh, transition. I've continued on with it. I've also become a member of I Conquer MS's uh, research committee, and uh, I've been a uh, reviewer for the uh, congressionally uh, uh, directed uh, uh, MS research program. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, when I get a, a request, would you consider joining XYZ group? Uh, Uh, my automatic is yes, uh, to the point where one of my good friends said to me um, when I said I, I thought I was probably not going to uh, uh, ask someone to do a, a favor for me. Uh, she looked at me and said, this coming from someone who doesn't have no in his vocabulary. So I, it's been a wonderful uh, experience. Uh, these are all my friends. These are the people who are my support group, as it were. So it's really great to, to connect again and again. I love seeing you all. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so we have legislative support. We have education. Um, we have a sharing of information with our peers. Um, uh, similar to Seth, I came from a, a medical background. I've been an RN since 1973. Um, so I'm, I'm well into this journey and it was only two years later that I ended up in the hospital with my first episode uh, that turned out to be MS, but it took another 19 years after that to get a diagnosis. Um, I think advocacy for me comes a lot with teaching people how to talk to their healthcare team. And um, as a nurse, I, I feel like that's what I've done for most of my, most of my professional days. Um, I, I found though that it was a little harder to advocate for myself than it was to tell people how to advocate for themselves. Um, I remember one episode where way back when, about 20 years ago, we didn't have very many choices for medications. And I had just come off of an educational event that the foundation had presented. And we had just had a new medication come, come to the US from Europe approved by the FDA. And I was determined I was gonna go on it. And 
So when I saw my doctor, he, uh, he asked how I was doing. And I said, not wonderful. Um, he said, we'll do more steroids then. And I said, no, but we are going to change my meds. And he was very taken aback by that. This was back in the day when we had three meds on the market. And um, so he asked me what I wanted to change it to. And I told him and he said, you won't like that. And I said, why? And he says, too many side effects. He said, like what? And he just listed off the, the side effects that are on the label. And I said, you know, uh, as far as injection site reactions, I can, I can handle that. Um, I've been injecting for two years. I've been teaching people how to handle injection site reactions. And, and I refuted his, his uh, pushback, but then I, I just thought, wait a minute, what do you think the side effects of MS are? And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, they're different for each of us, but for me, I can't get too far from a bathroom because I'm cathetering, catheterizing half a dozen times a day. Um, I'm no longer legally able to drive because my vision is so poor. Um, and that's kind of making me a hermit and it's dampening my mood and, you know, there's a lot of things going on that are side effects of my MS and I feel like I owe it to myself and you owe it to me to facilitate this change. And he'd never thought of MS in terms of a disease that has side effects, only medications. So um, what, what are you guys doing right now that are advocating um, congressionally? What is the focus of your advocacy right now? We just actually spoke about um, congressionally, like money going for MS research and that just how important research is. And that, you know, look at all, Sherry, when you were talking about three medications, when Dan and I were diagnosed, there were only three different medications to treat the progression of the disease and now there's over 20. There's close to 25. I mean, and that's, you know, um, MSRP and we're talking about that. Well, and, I, and that's the other issue, the big issue that we talked about too. And um, Seth, you were involved in the public policy conference too. And I don't know, um, but just as far as, you know, legislation that will help to control the cost of pre prescription drug prices and to make it just more affordable for people living with MS. And I think the big push was we have all these drugs now to help slow the progression of the disease, but it doesn't do a lot of good if people can't afford mm -hmm. to buy the drugs. And so that's a big push. And we've been talking about, you know, the affordable medications for years. And so I think that's something that's always been a push for what we've been doing with our legislators um, at, the, at the federal level. Mm. I, I absolutely agree. The, uh, the, the theme seems to be year in and year out because we're constantly worrying about these issues uh, are uh, the issue of research because research, uh, as inflation goes up, you need more money in research or else those projects that were started uh, can't really keep up with what they are designed to figure out. Um, and uh, you need to increase regularly and consistently or else you just lose uh, the benefit of research. And then the other side is what you're talking about with medication. These medications are costing more and more uh, each year uh, the, the cost does not seem to go down, even if it's one of the quote unquote older drugs and or if it's a generic. So it, you know, it, it really is a problem. So we have to raise awareness to our elected officials and ask them to please help us do something to make the problem uh, go away, as it were, uh, or at least figure out a way to uh, convince our elected officials to get on the bandwagon with us. And, and fight for the cause uh, of people who are dealing with chronic disease. Mm -hmm. 
I think it's equally um, important. There are some pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies that do have aid for, um, for MS patients so that your copay can be zero or, um, or very minimal. But I think there are part of educating, educating others with MS is to also educate to the fact that you, you can get some of these medications uh, you can talk to your healthcare provider or the the society, for example, to 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 advocate on on that person's behalf or how to do this, so that they too can get um, the medication at a at a low cost. Because, as everyone has said, the the medications are are so it's cost prohibitive. It, all of them. I don't think there's one or any one in particular that's any less expensive than any other one. And if we didn't have the help of all of these foundations, as well as the pharmaceutical companies, um, I, for me, for example, I don't know how, how I would do it. I, I know my MS would definitely not be in check. Yeah. And that's, that's scary. And John, to your point, filling out that paperwork, asking for assistance, that's advocating for yourself. You know, just simply saying, look, these medicines are too expensive. You know, neurologists, they can prescribe the medicine, but do they realize how expensive it is or what the side effects are? I think that people need to realize using your voice, telling your story, that's advocacy. It can be somewhat intimidating. I know the first time we went to legislators, it's intimidating, but it's just, these are people that need to hear our voices. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that's really important to continue and to yeah. do. Yeah, because I like you, to your yeah. point, Sean, too, it is. It's like, even that when you're asking for the help, I mean, it's like, because we, we can say advocacy and like, and talk on levels of like, oh, go to your legislators and stuff. It can happen just like that, talking to your doctor talking to people. I mean, it's like, you know, my, my employer, I do not, there are no MS medicines on the prescription formulary for us because they're so expensive, but then you go and you get your neurologist and, and it's advocating. And, you know, so my employer, I think they just want to make sure that this is a necessary medication. And so, but they're, you know, it's advocating for yourself and using your voice where where it's needed most and so i think that's you you made a great point about that just with the medicines and stuff yeah dan can i quick, quickly jump in and, and i think this is a very important point that we aren't we don't start out to be advocates that's not why we get involved with this we start out because we see a problem that we are experiencing or people we know are experiencing or the combination. Uh, and we say, okay, how, how can we impact it? Um, and the way we impact it is by raising voices, educating, educating everyone. It's amazing who listens to webinars and who listens to uh, 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 lectures. Um, it, it's, it's, and, and what the, the person with MS brings is not just the analytic data that is dry and everyone is just tired of hearing. You are telling a personal story of how the disease has affected you, your loved ones, everyone uh, who cares for you. Um, and uh, it, it's much more impactful. It is a true story. It's, it's a, as they say, putting a face to, to the disease. And it's, it's extremely important. I think one of the things that people may not realize is that the cost of these MS medicines um, has gotten, as we said, prohibitive. Back when I made that med change 20 years ago, um, the four meds on the markets ranged from $800 to $1,200 per month. They're now closer to $9,000 per month. So people, people that are on private insurance or even uninsured persons can often get the support that you're talking about from drug companies. 
Um, however, when you make that switch to Medicare, which a lot of us that were on social security disability or are aging out of, <laughs> of that and, and into actual social security, um, we cannot get those medications uh, that are self-administered. Uh, there is a 40% a copay out of that $9,000 a month on um, Medicare on Part D. And the, the history behind that, I, a lot of people I don't think realize the history behind that when, when there was a big row back in, I think it was the 1990s about how the pharmaceutical companies had doctors in their pocket and were getting doctors to prescribe certain medications by giving them benefits, golf vacations that could be written off as education. And so Senator Ted Kennedy in Massachusetts introduced legislation that would disallow the drug companies from giving anything as an incentive. And that went right down to pens and pads of paper. Um, and as a result of that, it meant that they couldn't give free drug to people who were in governmental insurance programs. The following year, Senator Patrick Kennedy in Rhode Island, nephew to Ted, got the same legislation enacted in Rhode Island, and then it became federal legislation. So one of the things that really needs advocating right now is to get that caveat taken out of the legislation that disallows the drug companies from helping people that are in government insurance programs. There shouldn't be that, uh, that inequity there. So just a little piece of history to add some context to this. Uh, Sherry, I think you, you brought up a great point um, earlier as far as asking your doctor to change, um, switch your medication. I, I had something very similar in that when I was diagnosed, there were a few uh, medications out there and there was a new medication on the market that was in, in a pill form and my physician did not want um, for me to change. And, and, and I think it's very important for people to know that as you mentioned, you got that pushback and you were able luckily to, to counter um, his, his argument by, by, by being intelligent and coming, you know, showing him, look, this is what I am going through. And I think a lot of times doctors don't necessarily understand that. So I got that same pushback and for me, it was, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I feel like when I have MS and these, this medication actually gives me the same side effects as my MS. So why, why would I not want to change? And I think a lot of us get, um, because it's a physician, we, we hold them in, in high esteem and not that they should not, but if we, we know what our bodies are like, and if we want to take the chance by going on something that's completely different or new, then we should be allowed to. And if that doctor has that pushback, it's okay to go and get another opinion and go to another doctor. I think that's very important for people to know that although they are physicians, they do not always have the last word. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a good point. And so we're therefore advocate, we're still advocates for, for ourselves. Right. And, and I think then too, to be, and that's where, you know, the, I don't want to say responsibility, because that sounds so um, overbearing, but I mean, that's like, and then it's our responsibility as people living with MS, we need to educate ourselves about what's out there and, you know, and to know what what medication we want to advocate for and I think that um, I'm not putting Jennifer on the spot but I'm going to put Jennifer on the spot but just talking about when you switched medicines and just how you knew I had the pushback from my doctor like you Sean like you shared 
and he at the time was not comfortable with the medication choice I was taking. Keep in mind, I was diagnosed a long time ago. Um, it was in the 90s when I was diagnosed and uh, my neurologist wasn't comfortable. And so I had to, he wouldn't put me on it. And I, I really, really thought that my MS was progressing and sure enough it was. And I had to say, doctor, I really respect you. I really like you, but can I see a different doctor, a different neurologist? And that's, and he with all, you know, with blessings and, you know, I want you to do what's best for you. But I did leave my, my neurologist. And so sometimes, you know, knowing what, knowing what your body wants and needs is really important. So. Yeah, but I mean, it's just that just understanding and knowing what's out there and talking to other people, because I think that's the big thing is when it comes to advocacy. I mean, like right here, I mean, we've got a group of, you know, three other advocates that it's just like you, you talk to people, you get this. It's not like you don't have to sit up all night doing research papers and stuff, but it's just talking to your friends, talking to your colleagues, just like, what have you heard of this? You know, and so I think it's like, that's the beauty of you know, from when Jennifer and I were diagnosed, you know, when, you know, years ago, and then it's just like the internet and just online communities, just to be able to find the people to get the information you need. Mm. Yeah, one of the things that I've found is that um, I stuck with that doctor. I've been with him for 20, 22 years now. Um, and it's getting to the point where when I go in for my appointment, he says, so what are you hearing? What's new? Yeah. Um, and it's like, once he got over that hump, he started, he saw such a change in me after I went on that medication. He'd never seen me erect. He'd always seen me in a scooter or walking with the assistance of someone along with a cane. And when I went in, three months after for a three month checkup after changing meds I was walking with a cane but I was erect and he didn't recognize me at first and he thought maybe I'd gotten my hair cut um you know it was it was a typical guy response you know <laughs> did you get your hair cut <laughs> no I'm standing um and um he was so impressed with how well I had responded to the medication change. Um, I, I ran into the, the drug company rep at one of my appointments and she winked at me and she said, you know, he has become my top prescriber in the region over the last six months. Wow. Um, and and um, with the different treatments that I've evolved through over the years, he's done similar things and he's kind of tried it out on, on his older patients. And um, now he's a real advocate for getting people onto that are on Medicare, that are older, that are maybe in that uh, secondary progressive range onto a specific drug that he really likes that's relatively safe. I've been on it for eight years now, and I really feel like it's gotten the MS pretty much completely under control. So. Um, we can teach our doctors. It can be a good relationship. It can be an advocacy relationship with our doctors. We just yeah, need I, to learn not to push too hard. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a that's a great point, uh, Sherry. You know, and and I'll tell you the other thing. Looking at this panoramically over time, because I was watching this as a practitioner for many years at first. Um, because of the advocacy that went before us and the people who made uh, the inroads that taught us how to become advocates, uh, the interest in patient-directed research is something that is just, it, it has mushroomed, it has gone, gotten so big. And it's important because when it's patient-directed, you are asking questions that are of interest to the to the patients. It's not the uh, research basic. Uh, the basic research is still being done. Don't misunderstand me. But in terms of practical research, how do people? What do people need to have a better life? To cope better? To uh, to to 
day to day be uh, in better shape. Uh, a lot of research is now coming through groups like ICONC or MS that is uh, really directed at the questions that we have as patients. And I think it's, it's a direct response to the advocates for years who have been trying to get uh, physicians to listen to them uh, and, and everyone else to listen to them. And now we're just continuing the, uh, the uh, fight forward as it were. And I think, Seth, a lot of that, uh, you mentioned I Conquer. I think there, there are so many organizations now that are really, it's patient-centered. Um, and it, as you mentioned, it really does come from that advocacy. It's knowing the pharmaceutical companies, the physicians knowing that they have to get the patient involved. We, we are the best advocates. We're going through all of these trials and tribulations, who knows better than us what, what the progression of the disease or, 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 um, or how we're feeling emotionally, physically. And that's, that's it's so, when I started um, knowing that I wanted to be an advocate uh, back in, I think 2012 or so, um, I really, you know, I, it's amazing to see the progression from 10 years ago to what our voices really mean now and the impact and the fear that um, research had for so many of us. And now we're, we're Hispanics and, and Blacks, African-Americans are, are getting more comfortable with the advocacy and the research part because it all comes from these great organizations that are really saying, you know, we need to be part of that solution. Right. Um, people may not know that are watching what I Conquer MS is. It is, as, as Sean said, it's a patient powered research network. Um, it's actually becoming a patient driven research network. Um, if for example, you want to know, is there research on what diet works best for people with MS? You can, you can search that. If there's not an answer out there, I Conquer MS entertains your research question, and they will help to develop a research project around answering your question. And um, I, I think in the six years that I was uh, on the research committee for that organization, uh, it really brought to mind how important each of our voices is. If you want more information on that organization, go to their webpage. It's www.iconquerms.org and um, become a member, lend your voice to the research that's going on. Um, help them to, to learn if there are patterns that develop over time by answering surveys every year that are similar. So you can see how your disease even is progressing over time. I think we're at a point now um, where we can open this to questions from the audience. Um, if you have a question or a comment, you can you can ask it by using the Q&A down at the bottom of the page. I see that someone has already ticked a question in. How do I become an advocate for MS? I've had relapsing remitting for 50 years. I'm now retired and 69. Um, I, I think there are any number of ways. I Conquer MS is one of those ways. Um, certainly you can get in get involved through the uh, MS Foundation, through the Multiple Sclerosis Society, the National, or uh, the MS Association of America. There are a number of different advocacy organizations. Um, Rotary International has uh, an MS awareness and education group. Um, so if you're a Rotarian, ask about their Rotary Action Group. There are a number of different things that you can do. But anyway, uh, tick in your questions to the Q&A 
tick them into the chat. Uh, if you want to make a comment in the Facebook live feed, we'll try to keep on top of that. Um, if there's a specific person that you want to have answer your question, feel free to say who it is that you'd like to hear from. And um, let's go ahead and get this started. It would help if I used the right mouse. I have my laptop set up to watch um, to watch the live stream, and I'm using the mouse for the laptop <laughs> to try to get your comments. And Sherry, I would just like to add one thing because I know the advocacy can be a little intimidating, as I said. But Dan and I go to a church that is pretty awesome and we really like it. And they had, I'm in a wheelchair, as I mentioned, they had one curb cut. And so I would get to church and have to haul myself all the way down to the other end of church to get the curb cut and then go all the way back. So I was backtracking. And one day it was winter because it is Michigan. And I said to my pastor, wouldn't it be awesome if we had a curb cut at the other end of church? And she said, gee, Jennifer, I think we can arrange that. And that simple act of advocacy, I'm not the only person that uses a curb cut. But now if somebody's bringing a child, a baby in a stroller, or another person in a wheelchair, just that simple adding another curb cut to our church made it more accessible. And that was, that was using my voice. So simple things like that. Mm. Let's see, I had some questions jotted down that um, were sent in in advance. Um, Seth, are there absolute do's or don'ts that uh, an advocate should know about before they get going? Yeah, I think there are because um, I, I've 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 almost made these mistakes, and I luckily was educated before I made them. Uh, when you're going to see an elected official, um, never ever ever, regardless of whether you've done it or not, never say to them, "I donated to your campaign," because that is an absolute no-no. Uh, you can say, I support you. I am absolutely, I, I agree with your policies. You can do anything else you want, but do not try and put them uh, on the defensive by, by basically saying, well, I gave you money, therefore you have to do things for me. That's a big mistake. Um, I, I think that's, that's probably the major one. Um, the other thing I would say is, uh, whether or not you support your, uh, your uh, elected official, they are your elected official. And MS is not a, a party uh, specific disease. Uh, Republicans get it, independents get it, Democrats get it, and all the way down the line. Um, so what you basically have to approach it as, don't approach it as, well, I didn't vote for you. You're in, you're in a party that, that I don't approve of or don't support. Um, approach it as you are my representative. I need help. My community needs help. And I want to educate you on why it's important to support uh, our needs. And it just understand that you're talking person to person. You're not talking as a constituent with a certain label uh, to a uh, elected official with a different label or the same label. You are talking as a person with a heartfelt issue that you want to get their support for. And it shouldn't make any difference what the party is uh, of either group, quite frankly. Uh, Casey has just typed a uh, link into the chat for those of you who are interested in ways to get involved with advocacy and suggestions from the foundation. Um, feel free to click on that link. Also, um, does any one of you have what you would consider to be uh, a real advocacy success that you want to share? Jen? 
you're looking like. I, I think any time that we get to share our story and a legislator walks away knowing a little bit more about multiple sclerosis and the reality of the disease, uh, we've, we've had really, we've had good experiences. But again, I mean, just that simple little curb cut at my church, that for me was a real accomplishment as simple as it sounds. I think, you know, what one su success story was that, you know, in the with advocacy and everything, when your legislators are back in district during August, you know, we always try to schedule an August visit where, because, you know, most times of the year they're out in DC or whatever. And so, there was one time we were pushing to get a, a, a meeting with our senator um, in district thinking we'd have to go down to Lansing to meet with her uh, or uh, one of her staff members, which staff members are great to meet with. But, you know, then it's like when you actually get to meet with a senator, it's like, oh, my gosh, that's so cool. Well, it just so happened. And we were so mad because August came and went and we didn't hear back from them. And then early September, we, we got an um, email from her staff member, and the senator was actually going to be here in town for a Habitat for Humanity event. And they were like, she'll have 10 minutes after that event is done. If you can meet her, it was just like this, this deal going down, meet her at the corner mm -hmm. of this street and this street at this time. But you know that we sat on the picnic table outside of the new Habitat for Humanity house with our senator and just talking about, and she's a huge advocate for prescription drug pricing and stuff. And so, I mean, just to be able to have that relationship built with your senator that they would make time for us it's just like you know nice. then you're just thinking that was that was really special and so that was um i'd say that was a good success story now i i just want to jump in there i would emphasize that there's no such thing as too small of an individual to to contact or get in touch with you know, certainly the aids are extremely important. Anyone who's ever watched CNN or any of those uh, uh, news uh, outlets, the people whispering into the, the senator's ears are the aids. And, and meeting with an aide, uh, never roll your eyes and say, oh, my God. Uh, it, it's an important thing. It's a very good thing. And it's often the most consistent uh, uh, contact that you get. So uh, the aids are extremely important, but going back to the issue of the level, um, I've been very involved with the local county level of, of uh, my government. So I've gotten to know the county government very, very well. And by extension, I've gotten to know my state senators and state representatives and state organizations such as disability commissions. Uh, and, and eventually, those people grow up and go on to be other things. So right. some of those people went on from being state representatives or local county representatives to then being uh, uh, senators or congressmen uh, at the federal level. So these people grow up and become those positions. So it's important to start at every level. I have a question that just came in from Jill. Um, she says, are you saying that government insurance doesn't cover our MS drugs? I apologize. I didn't understand what you were saying. Um, Medicare does not cover any self-administered medication. So that's all of the injectables and all of the orals. So um, our doctors are sometimes, in order to keep us on medication, um, having to make decisions to put us on an infusion medication that has to be given in an infusion center. Meds that are given in an infusion center are covered under Medicare Part B. Um, if you don't have a Part C or supplemental insurance, you may be covering 25% of the cost of the actual um, equipment for the infusion. So it would be the tubing, um, the solution, that sort of thing. Um, 
it's generally not a high cost and it's something that you can negotiate with your health system, the infusion center. If you really, if that's even too much for you, you can negotiate with them to get some help with that. So I hope that answered your question. All right, Sean has just said, I Conquer MS is helping children with MS and they have a research project now for children with MS. Um, when I Conquer MS was first started, we only worked with people 18 and older and there's last count somewhere around 10,000 under the age of 18 diagnosed with MS here in the United States. Uh, most of them between the ages of 15 and 18, but there's still kids as young as a year or two years old being diagnosed at this point. So I'm um, glad to hear that. Um, all right, let's see. Are you comfortable sharing? This is from Elizabeth. Are you comfortable sharing what the meds are for women similar to your experience? Um, you mean the disease modifying therapy meds for women? Same as for men. Um, he really was asking specifically, Sherry, you, you had mentioned uh, your infusible medication and she was curious about what you were taking. I'm taking Rituxan, which is biosimilar to Ocrevus. Um, it's less than half the cost though. Um, so insurance companies that are hesitant to um, cover the cost of Ocrevus, oftentimes, most of the time so far, are covering Rituxan. Um, side effects for that drug are minimal. Um, Jen, you're on that too, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, I, I have to say it is the easiest medication that I've taken in the last 20 years. And I've been on seven. So, um, and it, I didn't notice any real difference when I first started on it. And I thought after a couple of years that uh, maybe it wasn't working as well as the ones that had more side effects. But then I, I realized that the previous two years had been loaded with stress for me. I was driving 900 miles in over the course of three days, um, every four weeks to take my dad to the oncologist. And uh, so I would drive up the 300 some miles to his place on a Sunday afternoon, get his medical records together on Monday, drive them to the oncologist on Tuesday and then back to their house and then back home. So on Tuesdays, I was driving more than 500 miles and then back to work Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and Saturday. Um, so my stress levels were huge. Um, and it took a good year after both of my parents died for me to realize that, oh, I really am better. The stress had to, had to minimize and, and allow me to get those things off my plate so that I could take stock. And um, I, I guess in a sense, I'm advocating for you to say, you need to take stock periodically and see if there's something on your plate that maybe shouldn't be there, that's maybe making things worse. So um, let's see, do we have any eye conquerors helping children? I don't see any other questions. I see, let's see. Well, we still have a couple of minutes left. Do any of the rest of you have something that you want to add that uh, came to mind as we were talking? I, Jerry, think I, I just saw a question uh, about burnout. Oh, and, yeah. And I, I just wanted, wanted to say, um, I, I experienced burnout when I was practicing medicine. That's when I had my burnout. Uh, but the question of how do I avoid burnout, I am careful in selecting what I agree to, shall we say. Uh, as as I come mentioned, I don't often say no, uh, but there have been occasions. Uh, and when I say yes, I make sure that my commitments are spread out. Mm -hmm. If they don't fit properly, 
I will suggest that maybe if I'm, <clears throat> for instance, being asked to follow through a webinar, I'll say something like, well, I, I'm doing one uh, in very close proximity to when you want to have yours. How about if we <clears throat> move yours out at some point because you haven't announced it yet. Um, and, and there's often leeway in, in the way the scheduling goes. So I, can, I have the, the luxury of spreading out uh, my commitments to a certain extent. And I know when the fixed meetings that happen for the national societies uh, uh, are gonna occur. I know March is gonna be extremely busy each year because it's MS awareness and, and, and MS month uh, in this country. So I often do not sign up for extra things in March, but uh, other than that, there, there's always a way of, of uh, mitigating the stress, uh, at least I've been able to so far, I'll knock on wood. Thank you. Um, anybody want to share, uh, do you ever get uh, real nervous or uh, shaky or embarrassed when you're trying to advocate with a legislator or with a doctor, how do you overcome that? Know your stuff. <laughs> I really think if, I mean, all of us living with multiple sclerosis, we're passionate about our disease. We're passionate about taking care of ourselves. So if you're honest about what this, what this means to you, you've got a humongous leg up on you know nerves that if you're honest and sincere and also just if you have a lot of numbers don't be ashamed to have notes mm -hmm. or just know as much as you can and dan and i always say lean on your team you know if you have family that you're going to a doctor's appointment with or if you have fellow ms advocates you're advocating with kind of share the load and that's good for MS in general, just share the load. Yeah, if I, if I could jump in on that one too, you know, um, frankly, you're never alone when you're doing advocacy as, 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 was, uh, as Jen was saying. The, um, the issue is you're always going as a team. And even if no one on the team has an answer to a particular question, it's always perfectly fine to say, I'll get back to you with that information. And that's perfectly fine. What you don't want to do is make up uh, an answer that you're not sure about. That's the, that's the death knell. But if you're not sure, it's okay to say, look, I'm going to make some inquiries and I'll get back to you in the, in the next week or so. And that's perfectly fine. And remember that your elected officials want to be, uh, at least most of them, I would hope, want to be supportive and appreciate what you've been going through. Um, so you're not gonna have too much of an antagonistic relationship uh, going into it. It's not as scary as it seems at first. Although I know I was scared when I first went in for the first couple of visits, but it goes away pretty quickly. And, and I, would, I would only say that it, it's okay to be scared um, I still get nervous if I, if, if I do one of these webinars or if I have, when we, before COVID, when we used to um, have speeches and we meet with the doctors and patients and, um, and it's okay, it's okay to have those butterflies. Um, but the thing is that we're still getting out there, we're still advocating, even with all the fear, um, we're, we're putting ourselves out there and it's important to know that it's, it's okay to be scared. Um, there's, there's no shame in that. So um, I, I think that that would really help. And I think when I was scared, like when our, you know, first meeting with a legislator and everything, it's just reality. If you're doing it with a public official, they work for you. You know, and so it's just like that. That's where it takes some of the pressure off. I mean, they, you know, obviously respect them, but it's like, and they're they're people just like just like we are, and so it's just like they want to hear our story. It's just like really when it comes to advocating and stuff, you're telling your story, and you're the expert of your story. So always have that 
um, to fall back on. And also know too, and I think ties back to, you know, with Seth's question of do's and don'ts. I think one thing you'll always do is always follow up with a thank you to the legislator and everything. And then know that, you know, you can beat yourself up after the meeting. It's like, oh, I should have talked about this. I should have talked about that. That's the beauty of the thank you, because then you can always follow up and say and reiterate that point. So, I mean, could I always think, could the meeting have gone better? Well, possibly, but at the same time, that's what a thank you is, is good for. And then also for the next meeting. And so I think, yeah, it, and I think that is good to be nervous going into it because that keeps us all on our toes, you know, it makes you be prepared for it. So I think, you know, you're the expert of your story. And so that's. And it's never going to be the same as anybody else's. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Well, thank you all for partaking in this, participating in this. Uh, thank you to the audience that has been here and very active in chat and on Facebook. Um, it brings us to the top of the hour. Um, so that's the end of our time. If any of you missed any part of this conference, it, will be, it was recorded and it will be available through the MS Focus YouTube page, or it will be up for probably another day or two uh, on Facebook Live. I've, I've found that these tend to stay out there for a couple of days. Um, reply to your registration email for information on how to access these recordings or sign up for our newsletter to learn more about upcoming events. Our next teleconference is going to be this coming Thursday, March 24th. Um, and we have Dr. Adam Schaefitz, who will be speaking to us about how to access the care that we need. Um, and he's gonna be talking a little bit about insurance and about getting help with medical expenses that we can't afford. That'll be aired at 3 p.m. Eastern time this coming Thursday, March 24th. Um, when this presentation ends, you'll have a little survey that pops up on your screen. Please don't log off until you've ticked in this real quick response to the survey. That's really essential for us to get the grants that help to provide this sort of educational event for you. So I thank you in advance for doing that. Um, I really sincerely thank our sponsors and each of you who attended and participated, especially my friends that have come to help present this. Um, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>